Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today once again. Um, we have with us Ambassador Elaine White Gomez of Costa Rica, who will brief you on the conclusion of the UN conference to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. Ambassador White, welcome. You have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, I thank you for, for your presence here. Well, you already know the good news. The United Nations formally adopted the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This is a historic moment for the international community. This is the um, first multilateral nuclear disarmament treaty to be concluded in more than 20 years. We have accomplished the mandate that the United Nations General Assembly provided the conference with to conclude as soon as possible this legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. This process enjoyed the overwhelming support of the international community. More than 130 states participated in the conference and over 100 non-governmental organizations participated as well. Needless to say that the presence of the victims of the atomic uh, bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and those uh, also affected by nuclear tests throughout the world has been of vital importance for all the delegations. The treaty that we have adopted has not only complied with the mandate of the General Assembly to uh, build a norm that strengthens, complements, and supports the existing architecture this non -dis uh, of, the, the, no, of the disarmament sphere. But it also has captured the aspirations of the overwhelming majority of those participating in the conference, including the civil society. And this is something that I would like to stress because it has been the enthusiasm, the knowledge, and the collective experience of civil society that has kept the pressure throughout the decades so the international community moves towards the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The prohibitions which are included in Article 1 constitute the heart, the very core of the treaty. And they are intended to cover a full range of nuclear weapon related activities. These prohibitions have been carefully crafted in such a way so as to be clear, concise, and comprehensive. At the same time, keeping in mind the inclusivity and flexibility, and also the non-discriminatory nature that were at the heart of the political will of this conference. The treaty also has provisions to allow the nuclear weapon states and to invite the nuclear weapon states when they so consider to be ready to become state parties and start their uh, process of elimination of their nuclear arsenals within uh, this regime and also in coordination with uh, the conference of state parties and designated um, competent international authority. The treaty for the first time also includes positive obligations relating to the assistance to victims of the testing and use of nuclear weapons, as well as for the environmental remediations of areas contaminated as a result of nuclear weapon activities. The treaty has thus been designed for the future and as a concrete, concrete tool to advance the common aspirations of the international community. All the peoples of the world aspire to build a world of peace, but also a world free of nuclear weapons. That is the common objective within all peoples and all states in this international community and the United Nations share and we have come one step closer to that, towards that end today. I want to, to thank you all for following on this, on this uh, process. It has been an intense, 
but also a very emotional process in which all the delegates have felt a very deep conviction and determination to conclude as soon as possible this mandate um, given by the General Assembly. As I said, we all feel very emotional today. We feel that we are responding to the hopes and to the dreams of present and future generations, that we undertake our responsibility as a generation to do whatever is in our hands, to achieve and to move the world towards the dream of a world free of nuclear weapons. I thank you very much, and I will be available for your questions. Okay, um, over here, Sharon. Ambassador White Gomez, congratulations, and on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thanks for coming to talk with us immediately after the adoption. I know you must be exhausted. Are your eyes red because you've been crying or yes. because you're tired? Because I have been, I have been crying. So very, very emotional. So, yes. so let's take that emotion then and respond to the statement that has just come from the United Kingdom, France, and the United States. Quote, this initiative clearly disregards the realities of the international security environment. Accession to the ban treaty is incompatible with a policy of nuclear deterrence, which has been essential to keeping the peace in Europe and North Asia for over 70 years. A purported ban on nuclear weapons does not address the security concerns that continue to make nuclear deterrence necessary and cannot result in the elimination of a single nuclear weapon. How do you respond to that statement? First of all, the strong belief is that it is the international order that created the UN Charter, a uh, um, um, rules-based international order, what we strongly believe has kept peace in the world after uh, 1945. It is by building norms and strengthening the international architecture, the institutional architecture, that we strongly believe that we will uh, have a, uh, a better world, a safer world. We are working toward that end, building norms, building uh, institutions, building institutional architecture. Of course, if we only consider the, the current international situation to decide whether to act or not to act, you can always choose not to act. And you will be responsible not only for your action but also for your non-action. But if we look back in history, Several decades ago, when the Treaty of, of Non-Proliferation was signed, was negotiated and signed, it did not enjoy the uh, large number of countries that are state parties today. It has taken decades to work on the universalization of this norm. And within those decades, there were changes in the international community that allowed for all the um, permanent members of the Security Council to become state members. So it, it was not uh, something that was achieved in the first five years. And as I said, when there was a change in circumstances, there was the Treaty of the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons ready to serve as, as, as a cornerstone for the nuclear non-proliferation regime. So what are we, are we doing? What are we seeing with this, uh, with this treaty? We are expecting that it's going to become, uh, it is going to enter into force as soon as possible. And as it is the case with all families, when there is a, a, a new member that is born into that family, that family uh, starts to interact with the newborn and the new arrived member to the family, in which they, they become a, a well-integrated family. We strongly believe that this um, further develops the nuclear uh, non-proliferation regime and the disarmament regimes. And we hope that uh, together with all the, the components, we will have a safer world and a better international architecture. Yep. Thank you, Nizara Buda, Palmadin Television. In the issue, in the case of NPT, we have seen that those who were party in that treaty were discriminated against, for example, in, Iran, in the case of Iran, it was, came under a lot of pressure, whereas when it came to Israel or other countries which are not members of MBT, they enjoyed the immunity by the international community for developing weapons in, in the clandestinely or openly, overtly, like in the case of North Korea, and uh, they were immune from any accountability in this regard. How this 
treaty will be different in this case. If someone subscribed to it, and he will find himself obliged, whereas others will be immune. I think the first um, um, pillar of the political will of this conference has been to design a norm that is non-discriminatory so that all states uh, will be committed to the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The issue of non-compliance is uh, the challenge for all the regimes, for all the, the normative regimes, the legal regimes. And that is the reason why the, um, most of the regimes have uh, institutional arrangements to deal with the issues of follow-up, transparency reporting, um, follow up and oversight of uh, compliance and also uh, to deal with cases of non-compliance. <clears throat> so it is that institu institutional arrangement, that is institutional architecture that needs to take the, res the political responsibility to act when there are instances of non-compliance. I am not going to refer to other, uh, to other regimes or what has and has not happened, but in this case, it will be on, in the hands of the Conference of State Parties to evaluate the further measures or steps that would need to, to, to follow in order to, to make sure that the regime grows healthy and the norms are implemented properly and that the enough bridges of communication are built with uh, the rest of the architecture and also to look at the, at the, at the oversight and verification and the well-functioning of the, of the provisions of the treaty and the, the, that were the ones that were captured um, in terms of norms that reflected the political will of the General Assembly and of the conference as well. Okay. Thank you. It's a follow-up question to my friend Nizar. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayama from the Arabic daily Al-Quds Al-Arabi. Uh, as you know, there are... Uh, nine nuclear states. Five of them are the permanent members. We all know about them. There are four who are not members of NPT. Do you have any set of uh, incentives for those four nuclear weapons who are not members of NPT to join the new regime? Thank you. Yes, the important um, um, aspect, the most important aspect in, in terms of accession to the regime is that it is non-discriminatory and that all states uh, can join uh, this treaty, but that of course they have to commit to a process of elimination of their nuclear weapons. Uh, in that regard as well, there is a, an article that states that nothing in that treaty would undermine any international obligations that the, the, that the state parties have acquired vis-a-vis -vis other international uh, treaties. Therefore, um, treaties that are party to the NPT and other international treaties by becoming state parties of the, of the, of the, of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Non-Nuclear Weapons will not get away with their uh, previous commitments. To the contrary, this will reinforce the commitment of non-proliferation and of um, nuclear disarmament. But at the same time, those countries that are not, if they want to become state parties to the, uh, to the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, they will also have to comply with a, a process of elimination of their nuclear weapons and, and uh, start a process of be to becoming non-nuclear. Hello. Congratulations. I know it's been a rough ride, but it's a very joyous occasion, I think. Um, can I ask a quick question about, I, I think you mentioned earlier Article I was at the heart of the treaty, and I know there was a lot of debate uh, that we could listen to about the use or threaten to use nuclear weapons. Could you describe the significance of that in your view, and also was it a reason that Netherlands decided not to join in the treaty? Could you... Uh, elaborate on that a bit. Thank you. Yes, I thank you. I, I think for the case of the specific case of um, the treaties that uh, the, the countries that have not participated or in the specific case of uh, the country that has not been able to, to vote in favor, I think they have, um, they have taken the floor and explained and uh, it has been uh, webcasted. So 
the, their position is already known, so I will not speak for them on their behalf. It is true that uh, there was an important discussion about the inclusion <coughs> of the issue of uh, threat of use. <coughs> so it was finally agreed by the conference that uh, Article 1 should include a prohibition to use or to threaten to use uh, nuclear weapons in the understanding that the threat of use lies at the heart of the of the of the deterrence <clears throat> and the current um, security paradigms that were started um, after 1945 when the nuclear bomb and nuclear power was created. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coast for Access. Thanks for doing these briefings uh, two days in a row. I did want to, I, and I did hear what Netherlands said, so I wanted to, rather than, than ask you to speak for them, you know, they talked about their NATO obligations, which I guess is, is something is up for them, but one of their crit critiques was that it's not verifiable. They said this treaty is not verifiable, it undermined its credibility. So, with, not asking you to speak for them, but what, what would you, what's your response to that? Do you believe that they're wrong? Is it, in fact, verifiable, and what steps could be taken in the future to, to make it so if it's not today? Thanks. Well, I think also the language in the treaty also speaks for itself. The, the measures that, uh, that the conference uh, decided to include in terms of uh, verification are uh, already stated in Articles uh, 2 to 5. And also there was the, the, um, the additional function of the Conference of State Parties to further develop the regime and to further uh, uh, agree on additional measures they might consider to um, you know, to complement the existing uh, the existing status uh, status quo. Uh, the most important aspect is that <clears throat> this treaty has also has to be flexible. As I mentioned yesterday, the uh, the situation may vary according to the 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 level of um, <coughs> of the disarmament uh, of the of the nuclear program that is under the the, uh, the under disarmament in the regime. So the, 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 the regime needs to establish and to have a, a, a well-established function in the institutional uh, structure so that they can adapt and take additional measures. They can take the form of additional protocols uh, to the convention to deal with that and, and, and other specific cases. Over there in the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, I'm Takagi from Kyodo News Events News Agency. Uh, thank you for briefing. Uh, right after the adoption of the treaty, uh, nuclear weapon states, France, UK, and United States uh, uh, released a joint press statement. And it mentioned uh, we do not intend to sign, ratify, or uh, ever become party to it. Therefore, there will be no change in the legal obligations on our countries. So how would you respond, uh, react to it? I will say the same, the same um, comment that I, that I um, mentioned before, which is that um, the world changes and uh, situations might change. It is the same uh, situation that happened when uh, some decades ago the, the, the NPT entered into force. And perhaps at that moment, nobody could imagine that uh, all the members of the, of the Security Council were, or the permanent members of the Security Council were going to be state parties to the NPT. But as the world evolves and the international community evolves and geopolitics uh, also evolve, um, we might see a change in circumstances that will allow um, uh, current nuclear weapon states to uh, decide to to uh, to uh, eliminate their nuclear weapons and become state parties, or become state parties and uh, in that process also acquiring the the obligation and the commitment to uh, in a in a process of uh, cooperative uh, disarmament, start a process of of uh, destruction of their stockpiles and becoming non-nuclear. Thank you very much for the opportunity and congratulations, of course. Uh, two questions. What is coming next after today's treaty? And my second question is, what is the importance of provision related to the big teams in the treaty? Thank you very much.
Well, after the adoption, the this next step is the, is the signature. And uh, the, the text of the treaty has included uh, the mention, a specific mentioning that as of uh, September the 20th, the signature will be, will be open. This is uh, something that already will fall in the hands of the depository, which uh, uh, the conference has uh, uh, conferred to the Secretary General of the United Nations. So the next step is the, the signature. And um, we hope that many that, uh, many states will be able to to join and to and to uh, sign the treaty in the near future, so that it enters into force, which is the second step. Then, after the entry into force, um, the first meeting of state parties will take place to start taking all the necessary measures to works towards implementation, towards the universalization of the treaty, and also towards uh, building the um, necessary bridges of communication and coordination with the rest of the disarmament architecture. Now, it is um, very important also to mention that uh, and to reiterate that, yes, the, this is the first uh, uh, disarmament treaty in which there is also a recognition of the um, of the need to provide adequate assistance to the victims of uh, both nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon explosions, or testings, as well as for the environmental rehabilitation. Of course, we hope that these provisions will not be needed in the future because we, uh, what we are trying to do with these treaties, is to is to is to have um, a good international norm that will take us closer to uh, to the moment in which nuclear weapons are never used again under any circumstances. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, thank you, Stefano Vaccara for Radio Radical in Rome and uh, La Voce di New York. Um, did you expect I mean, did you have the right um, attention for the media? What do you think? I mean, during this work, the fact that, yes, today maybe there is enough attention, but in those weeks, in those days, uh, do you think that we, the media, should have done a better job? And if we didn't, do you think that this actually didn't help the pressure or who is not participating because on the hand, no, they care what what the attention of the world is about it. So, do you have any anything to tell us? I think you can play a very fundamental role now. Uh, you can follow the signature, uh, follow the entry into force, and see um, how it evolves as a norm, and see how it evolves when the first conference of state parties uh, uh, is going to take place. I think that uh, it is true that we did not, uh, were, we were not as covered by the media when we were in the middle of the negotiations. Um, at the same time, the, most of the sessions and the, the plenary sessions at least were completely, they were webcasted and were, were open. So there, was, there is a point in which delegations, uh, government delegations need to, to sit just among this, themselves to be able to negotiate and not being necessarily exposed to, uh, to, you know, to being in a, in, a, in a window, being exposed, and so that it can have a, 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 an environment that is uh, convenient for the negotiations. And usually that takes place in, 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 in closed environments. I think um, it would have been good to have uh, uh, more coverage at the very beginning of this process, but there was a point in the negotiations in which the states needed to have that, uh, that peace of mind in that um, um, space where they could feel uh, comfortable to negotiate. And I think that maybe was one of the reasons why and of course, the, the strong commitment and determination by the by the delegates, but I think that was one of the reasons why the the the, the talks and the negotiations were conducted in a very expedite manner, um, because at some point they, they knew they were um, among themselves in in 
in, in their conviction in their negotiation process. Now I do challenge you and I do encourage you to, uh, to take a, a, a good look at what, what, what comes next. This is the first time in, in, in 70 years since the organization was created that the world sees a norm to prohibit nuclear weapons. Um, it is the first time that the international law, uh, can, we can say that we have international law that covers all nuclear uh, or um, weapons of mass destruction. That is a significant achievement for the international community, for the international architecture. We are expanding the legal uh, and normative basis of the international community. And we have a norm that we hope that will go into, that is going to influence this, the, the behavior of states. And of course, the expectations of the international community as a whole. So we do expect that you, uh, that you play a very fundamental role as well in the future to see how this develops. Okay, last question over here. Yes, uh, Sumire Kuneda, Manich newspaper. Many countries mentioned about the law of the Hibaksha in this conference. And have you also affected personally by their testimony or any of your experience in, with them? And if so, how? Yes, we have to recognize that this, um, this initiative and this movement has a strong link um, to the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. So the presence of the Hibakushas and the fact that, that we have to recognize that they have been uh, committed through, throughout so many decades in, in sharing with the rest of the international community their own experience has been a fundamental driving factor in the success of this, of this negotiation process. They were there. They shared their experiences with us. They were sharing the negotiation process with us. We, were, we are human beings, so if you have a human being close to you and they tell you the experience they have, they have gone through and this, the horrendous uh, um, impact of nuclear weapons, it touches every delegate's um, human soul. And as I said, I've, I have said several times, this has been a, a process in which you see a combination of reason and of heart and, and a very um, deep conviction and moral conviction of the work that we had to accomplish. And we feel, I think we feel proud of, of um, returning to the General Assembly and say to the General Assembly, tell the General Assembly we complied, we fulfilled, and here is the treaty that you requested and then you encouraged us to conclude as soon as possible. So we did, and we, are, we feel proud about that. Okay, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much.